Like Kurt said, uh, my name is Pastor Josh Fralick. I'm here with my wife and our two kids. We're expecting another kid this month. My wife's severely pregnant, and so it could happen any day. So if she goes into labor while we're here, you guys, I'm sorry. I'm not going to be able to finish my sermon. Um, so I have some, uh, I'm blessed to have some family members with, my cousin, my grandparents, my, my dad, my aunt, my uncle, and some family friends. Uh, just really quick shout out, um, Bonnie and my grandma Linda. It's their birthday today. And so I just want to wish them happy birthday. And they're both about 30 years old, and so, <laughs> um, and so yeah, I'm super blessed to be here. Like, I, like Kurt said, I, I grew up in this church. Um, when I was younger, we, we, uh, me and my family, we left the Catholic Church from Mandan when I, I think I was about seven years old, and my grandparents came here, and we, we came, me and my, my couple of my brothers, and we, you know, told my mom and my dad, like, you know, can we please go to this church, because they had pool tables, and they had, back then they had the light club, and it was like, the whole building looked different, and the new addition wasn't even there, and uh, it was just like a fun place to be, so we wanted to come, and so we, we uh, started coming here in service, and by the time I was age like 13, 14, um, even though I had kind of grown up in the church and gone here on Sundays and was part of worship, play, play music, play guitar, I had never really developed a, a personal relationship with Christ, right? And so by the age of 13, like I said, 13, 14, I quit coming to church, right? I, I was dating girls. I was, I was only here for wrong reasons. I never developed that personal relationship with Christ. And as a result of that, I ended up for about six years becoming a, a pretty heavy drug addict. And for about six years in, in Bismarck, in town here, I uh, sold and distributed narcotics, and I smoked marijuana, and did pills, and I did all these things, right, to try to find some sort of, uh, with, with that, that video of the baseball players talking about instant gratification, right? So that's something that we all struggle with, it's sin. So I was trying to find that instant gratification in my life, and I was reaching out to things to try to fill that void that, um, as we all know, only God can fill. And uh, so as a result, I, at the age of 19, I ended up going to jail, got busted for selling narcotics next to a school, which is a double-A felony drug selling charge. And my bond was $20,000 cash only. And in that moment, in that state, uh, I had hit a rock bottom at a point in my life where I um, thought I had known things. I thought that I was living the right ways, trying to do things for my own selfish gain. And, and I it came to a crashing halt, and I realized that that wasn't the way that I should be living. And, and God got a hold of me in jail. Uh, I remember six years ago, Kurt, six and a half years ago, Kurt came to visit me in jail in Burley County here, and I was waiting to go to prison. And I remember family came and, and talked to me while I was there, and um, I, was, I was faced with the charge of going, going to prison. I was going to sit there. And God intervened. He, he divinely intervened in my life. And, and I, I started reading through the Gospels while I was in jail, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and God just removed a veil from my eyes, and He gave me a hope where I should have not had any hope in that place that I was in. And um, th- as a result, I ended up filling application Teen Challenge. If you guys show of hands, sort of Teen Challenge, North Dakota Teen Challenge. I'm sure you guys have going to this church. And a lot of times they do graduations here. And when I graduate, I, I did it here in this church. It was kind of a blessing. And uh, so I, I filled application, got accepted, and um, totally up to the judge's mercy. My bond is $20,000 cash only. Prosecuting attorney was trying to make an example of me, make me go to prison. And long story short, very long story short, God blessed me with a second chance. I got to go to Teen Challenge. The felony got to be able to wipe off my record if I completed the program five, zero, five years of probation, which I did. And I got called in the ministry. I went to Bible college four years where I met my wife, and, and the rest is history. So I've been following the Lord ever since. And I uh, met awesome friends along the way. And uh, Yeah, thanks. And so all that being said, uh, recently me and my wife have taken a position in Standing Rock Reservation where we live on the res, we live in Selfridge, North Dakota, and our parsonage is right next to the church building we have there. There's also a church building in Fort Yates that we are working, uh, me and my wife are working to, to get back on its feet and have evening services there as well. Some of the things we do in Standing Rock, um, if you guys don't know, there, there's a lot of poverty, uh, a lot of homelessness, a lot of um, kids growing up, in ho- growing up in homes without fathers, without parents, uh, drug use going on, alcoholism. And uh, there's just things there that are happening, and they're very evil and wicked as a result of sin in that place. Gambling, right? You, you drive to Fort Yates from Selfridge, and you, you come across a sign that says, Grand River Casino this way, Prairie Nights Casino this way. And as you're smack dab in the middle of, of this environment where it's, it's sin, you know? And so, um, and so God has called me and my family there to, to, to bring and share the light of Jesus, and to meet the needs, and to have mercy for people. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about mercy. So if, if it's up on the screen, if you guys have a Bible, we're going to be, I'm going to preach out of Luke 10, 25 through 37 this morning. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. So you can follow along with me, starting at verse 25. It says this, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Verse 31. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor of the man who fell among robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your truth this morning. We thank you that you have saved us, God, from a life of sin. You've forgiven us, and you bore the penalty for our sins when you died on the cross, for our sins and the sins of the world. And, and Lord, you have shown us great mercy, and we can follow you today. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us learn how we're supposed to show mercy to others in need, that you'd teach us, Father, through your word, as only you can do, Holy Spirit, um, what our role is in this thing called mercy, this thing called, um, called grace, being stewards of God's grace, and, and teach us what our role is this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So what is mercy? What does it look like? How would you describe it? What does it feel like? Have you ever experienced it? Have you ever given it to someone else? Have you shown mercy to others? As I was studying this passage, these questions kept coming to my mind as I read this story about Jesus and the lawyer and how Jesus explains the parable of the Good Samaritan. Our passage this morning starts off with a lawyer seeking to test Jesus, but instead finds himself to be the one that is tested. He asks Jesus in the first verse, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And how does Jesus answer him but by putting him to the test, right? Jesus replies, well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Of course, uh, man answers him. You see, Jesus being fully God already knew it was in this man's heart. Jesus could see it just as clear as he sees each and every one of our hearts in this room today. This lawyer was trying to put Jesus to the test by asking him a question about salvation, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers him by asking him a question. So the lawyer answers Jesus' question by saying, Well, the law says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And your neighbor as yourself. I'm kind of maybe under his breath, right? So Jesus says back to the lawyer, Yes, you have answered correctly. I knew you knew it. Do this and you will live. Verse 29, But the lawyer had ulterior motives for asking the question. It says, in verse 29, But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Right? Who is it? And what was Jesus' response? It's a parable. And then another question, of course. <laughs> Jesus answers the lawyer's question by explaining a parable and then asking him a question instead. The parable of the Good Samaritan is probably one of the most widely known parables from the Bible among both Christians and non-Christians today. Did you know that there's even a law named after this parable from this Bible narrative within our country that's active in all states called the Good Samaritan Law? Have you guys any, everybody heard of that law? Right? This law states that if you were to be driving down the highway and see a car accident and someone stuck in their vehicle, unable to get out on their own, and there was a gas leak, and the car was on fire, and you had only minutes to make a decision, and you decide to help that person to save their life, and immediately after you pull them to safety, their vehicle suddenly explodes, and you realize undoubtedly that you just saved that person's life, but for some reason in the process they were badly injured, say that because you pulled them out of the vehicle, you, something gets sprained or they break a bone. The Good Samaritan Law provides you, the rescuer, protection from being liable for any damages to the victim because you were simply trying to help your neighbor. 
this law that we have active in every state has its roots all the way back to our passage this morning. All the way back to a man trying to test Jesus to try to justify his own shortcomings in helping his neighbors. The answer is the parable of the Good Samaritan. So let's look again at verses 30 through 37. Jesus replied, A man was going down to Jericho from Jerusalem, or from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, verse 35, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So Jesus says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor of the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So from this parable, I'm asking you guys now, from this parable, which of these three men who passed by on the road was the man's neighbor? The response? The one who showed him mercy, right? The Samaritan. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. We are called to show mercy this morning. We are called to show mercy to those around us, to our family, to our friends, to our children, to our co-workers, to those who we don't even know by passing by on the street. We're called to show mercy to them too. We are called as children of God to show mercy to those in this world. Who is your neighbor? Everyone. The message of Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan is that everyone is your neighbor. It doesn't matter who they are, what they have done. To be part of the kingdom of God means that we are part of the kingdom of mercy. How do I know this? Just don't take my word for it. I know this because the Bible tells me so. So this morning I'm going to point out a few passages about mercy to help us better understand it and our role in it as children of God. So first, let's look at the book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 4 through 8. Against Titus 3, 4 through 8, it says this. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, no, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Verse 7, So that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Verse 8, This saying is trustworthy, And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. This passage from Titus, we learn everything we need to know about showing mercy because because we have received mercy. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of our works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. How should we know how to show mercy to others just like the Good Samaritan from the parable this morning? Because we have been saved. We have been saved not from anything good we have done, but according to God's own mercy. Therefore, we should be drawn, need I say compelled, to show mercy to others in our lives. Mercy to our children, mercy to our parents, mercy to everyone in our family, but more than this, we are called to show mercy to the complete strangers that we meet, in our lives every single day, just like the Good Samaritan. We are called to show love and compassion to a world that is full of hurt and dying people, struggling to survive, stumbling in sin, and desperately needing the grace of God and mercy of God in their lives. And this is shown through us, through believers. Let me ask you something. Have you ever seen a homeless person standing on the corner with a sign asking for help in some form? Right? sure we all have. Whether it's money or food or simply a kind word in a prayer, have you ever stopped? If so, why? What compelled you? If not, why not? Why didn't you stop? When Jesus tells this parable of the Good Samaritan and the man that fell among among robbers, 
is left half dead on the side of the road, Jesus does not say why this happened. Jesus does not say anything particular or specific about this man. Who knows? Maybe this man could have wronged someone and the robbers could have been taking revenge on this man. We don't know. We don't have that information. All we know is that he was left half dead on the side of the road, beaten and robbed. That's all we know. Maybe this man, by our own standards, right, by our own worldly, fleshly standards, could have deserved to be beaten and robbed if such a thing was possible. However, Jesus does not make mention of anything of the sort when explaining who this man was. What does Jesus say about this man? Simply this, that he was a man. (laughs) That he was a man, a human, a person, the same as you and I. Jesus doesn't need to say anything else because it is abundantly clear from this parable that the point Jesus is trying to make to this young lawyer is that everyone is our neighbor. It doesn't matter the type of person they are, because people are people, sin, mistakes, lifestyle choices, age, gender, it doesn't matter. People are people, and everyone is our neighbor. So we are called to love everyone, to show mercy to everyone. Now, I'm not saying, hear me clearly, I'm not saying that this means we are called to to be unwise in our giving and to not ask God about the ways in which we do give to support those in need. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this. We are called to show mercy to those who really are hurt and broken and in need of legitimate help. This is one of the reasons why God has called me and my family down to the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota. There are people there that are hurting and in need. There is poverty there that you might not have seen before in your life. There is hunger. There are children growing up in homes without food, clothes, diapers, and more importantly, without God. My family and I have been called by God to be the mercy of God in Standing Rock because of the people of Standing Rock are my neighbors, just like everyone else. And everyone here this morning is under the same command to love our neighbors as ourselves. Whoever God puts in your path, wherever God calls you to go, there are people there that need, desperately need the mercy of God. And by this, we will prove to be true disciples of Jesus Christ by showing them the love of Christ when they are in need, and by, when given a chance to tell them about Christ, of course, too. We are the mercy of God. Jesus has saved us by his own mercy, so that we can now show mercy to others by the same mercy that was shown to us when he saved us. Do you remember when you were saved? Show of hands. I do. Do you remember the feeling of all your sins being washed away? washing you whiter than freshly fallen snow. Isaiah 118 says this, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they'll become white like snow. Though they are like crimson, they'll be washed whiter than wool. If you are saved today, then you have been washed clean by the blood of Christ. No more sin, no more shame, no more guilt, no more condemnation. Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. We have received the mercy of God, and so we should be more than willing to show mercy and acts of kindness towards those who are in need in this world. We are called to love our neighbors as ourselves, which also means, brace yourselves, we are called to love our enemies too, right? I'm going to let that one sit for a minute. (laughs) Matthew 5, 43 through 47, Jesus says this, You have the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends his rain on on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. You see, when the Good Samaritan asks Jesus in verse 29 for a passage, sorry, not the Good Samaritan, when the lawyer asks Jesus passage, verse 29, he says, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replies with the parable of the Good Samaritan as to answer him about who his neighbor is. In this parable, a Jewish man was going down from Jerusalem on his way to Jericho. Given the fact that he was a Jew, puts a little bit more context in our passage this morning. Who was the first person that walked by him and didn't help him? Do you guys remember? A 
priest, a Jewish priest. A priest would not even stop to help his fellow Jew on the side of a road who needed help. Second person that walked by him, anybody remember? Levite, also a Jew. Likewise, he didn't stop to help his fellow Jewish brother out. No, none of these Jews stopped to have mercy on their neighbor, their friend. But who did stop? The Samaritan, who in that culture and time period in Jerusalem was the enemy of the Jew. So the Samaritan stops and helps not only a complete stranger, but a Jewish man who was his enemy. He helps him so much that he lets him ride his own animal, which in that culture which, which was, was a sign of authority, and usually the masters rode while the slaves walked alongside the one who rode. But this Samaritan showed an amount of mercy to the point where he did not care. He did not care what it looked like, what other people thought as they saw him walking, and the social status of himself was laid down for the sake of mercy. Jesus says it, it is better to love your enemies than to love those who love you already. And this story is a perfect example of that. In Micah, the Old Testament, in, in the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, it says, No, O people, no, you have it wrong. The Lord has told you what is good. And it is this, this is what he requires of you, is to, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This verse in Micah gives us three things that God requires of us, right? So do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. If we do these three things, then we will find ourselves as the Good Samaritan in the most unlikely of circumstances with the most unlikely of people, able to do what is right, to show them mercy, and walk humbly with God as the Samaritan walked humbly as his enemy rode above him on his own animal. And the thing to remember about our passage this morning is that the Good Samaritan that helped this Jewish man not only gave him a ride to where he needed to go, which was an inn to rest and heal and to eat and to get better, but also the Good Samaritan stayed with him the first night. We often forget that reading this parable. Stayed with him the first night watching him to make sure he was okay. And then, after that, he went the extra mile. He, he gave two denarii to pay for it, and then he said to the innkeeper, Whatever you, whatever's owed, I'll pay when I come back. Just make sure he gets better. Make sure he's well. This wasn't just to a family member, to a friend. The Samaritan did this to his enemy. To his enemy. How is this possible? Right? I'm thinking about people that have wronged me in my life. I'm thinking, how, how can I show mercy to them? if the opportunity presented itself, if the opportunity arose for me to show mercy to someone who had wronged me significantly, how, how do I show mercy to that person? How can we have compassion and even mercy to our loved ones, let alone our enemies, too? The answer is found, of course, in the Bible. The book of Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says this, Let your roots grow down into Jesus drawing up nourishment from Him so you will grow in faith, strong and vigorous in the truth you were taught. Let your lives overflow with thanksgiving for all He has done. What is the answer to how we are supposed to be able to show mercy and love showing mercy to others, even our enemies? The answer is this. We, are, we show mercy, right? We show mercy by recognizing the great mercy that has been shown to us by God. We live a life of thanksgiving and gratefulness for all He has done for us. And through this, we'll be able to show mercy to others. We are called to let our roots grow down into Christ himself, drawing up nourishment from him so that we can grow strong and vigorous in the truth that we're taught, the truth that we're taught today about mercy. Only when we are strong in the Lord can we show mercy to others to the magnitude of the Good Samaritan from our story today. So let me ask you this morning, how is your relationship with Christ? Are you growing in Him? Are you thankful today for what God has done? Are you able to say to God this morning, thank you. Thank you for providing for me and everything in this life. Thank you for always being faithful to me no matter what. Thank you, God, for saving me, for showing me mercy. Thank you, Father. Are you able to do that this morning? We are faced with the hard truth from the Word of God today. The truth is this, you cannot be in Christ if you do not show mercy. I'm going to say that again. You cannot be in Christ if you do not show mercy. Matthew 5, 7, 
It says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We are the instruments of God's mercy to others, and we are shown mercy by God in the past, the present, and in the future for the rest of our lives. If you are saved, if you are saved in this place today, you are merciful to those in need. In closing this morning, I want to challenge you with three things. Number one, let your roots grow down into Christ this morning so that you will grow in Him and be able to show mercy by His grace to even your enemies. Number two, how you do this is through prayer and through reading the Bible every day so that you can actually grow in the truth that is in there, in the Bible, and let God teach you through His Holy Spirit this truth every single day. And lastly, number three, live a life of thankfulness for what God has done in your life. If you do these three things, I assure you, that when the time comes for an opportunity to show mercy to someone, no matter who they are, what they've done, or what they look like, what kind of help they need, you'll be able to show them mercy and even love to do it. For those who've been forgiven much, love much. If you bow your heads with me, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the truth that um, we've heard today. We thank you for the story that we can draw lessons from and learn from, God. Pray in Jesus' name that you would help us, Father. Help us let our roots grow down into you this morning, Christ, drying up nourishment from you so we can grow strong and vigorous in this truth that we are called to show mercy to those in need. We're called to show mercy to our neighbors. And who's our neighbor? Everyone. We're called to show mercy to everyone and to love everyone. Lord, I pray that you'd help us do this this morning. I pray that you'd help us, Father, in our families, with our friends, with complete strangers and even our enemies. God, we can't do it apart from you. Give us a desire uh, to spend more time with you in, in prayer and reading the word. And Lord, give us a, an attitude of gr gratefulness, of gratitude, a heart of gratitude this morning. Thank you, God, for saving us by your own mercy. Lord, help us extend that to others, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.